for a moment unto the Lord with a voice of triumph. He's worthy. Come on, he's worthy. We praise you, mighty God. We worship your name. What a great privilege it is to be in the te Texas district with all of you great young people. Uh, I believe God has a word for us this week, and I just happen to be the vessel through which I believe God will do something uh, mighty in this place, not only me, but many of the men and women that will work this week very diligently and hard in these altars and in these services to see you young people make a lifetime commitment to the Lord Jesus Christ. Somebody say amen. Let me just tell you on the first night, I have not come to shadow box with you. I haven't come to fill you out, and I hope you haven't come to fill me out. I believe God wants to speak to us in a powerful way. I said, I believe God wants to speak to us in a powerful way. I believe we ought to set the tone tonight for the rest of the week. How about we send hell a notice tonight that says we came to youth camp to mean business, to worship God, to praise him, to give our lives to Jesus Christ. Praise God. What a great honor and privilege. It's an honor to have my wife. Uh, Cheryl with me this week. My twin daughters are still at home, uh, although they are camp age. Uh, they're 17 years old, and so I'm, I'm thinking in my mind, Calvin, just preach to your daughters, and if I can do that, we'll be all right. <laughs> Amen. But it's a great privilege and honor to be here with Brother Enzi and Brother Fuller and this youth committee. Let's give them a big hand of appreciation for all the work that they've done to get this thing kicked off and all the work they're going to do in the next few days. Amen. And I am privileged and believe that God wants to use me and use you to see a great move of God happen in this youth camp this week. Matthew chapter 27 and verse 46. Matthew chapter 27 and verse 46. I did not come tonight to pump up those that are already committed. I did not come to lick a candy stick with you. For those that are already dedicated to God, I came to reach for those tonight that are still on the edges, still not quite sure if you really want to make the, the commitment or pay the price to live for God. I believe God wants to speak to you tonight. Matthew 27, verse 46 and about the ninth hour, Jesus cried with a loud voice. Everybody say a loud voice. Saying, Eli, Eli, lama sabachthani. That is to say, my God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? Some of them stood there when they heard that, said, this man calleth for Elias. And one of them ran and took a sponge and filled it with vinegar and put it on a reed and gave him to drink and the rest said let be let us see whether Elias will come to save him notice in Matthew's writings in chapter 27 verses 46 through 49 he encompasses the entire crowd standing around the most momentous event that this world has ever known. Jesus Christ dying on a cruel cross at Calvary. And Matthew says some of them stood there and said he calls for Elias. One of them filled a sponge with vinegar and put it on a reed and stuck it to his lips. The rest of them stood by and said, let us stand and watch and see if Elias will indeed come. Some of them said he's talking to somebody else. One of them said, I'm going to put him out of his misery. While the rest said, let's just be observers and see what's going to take place. Well, we don't have room for some of them, one of them, or the rest of them. I'm praying tonight God calls us out from amongst the crowd and set us apart from some, from one, and from the rest and make us evangels on fire full of the Holy Ghost. 
Come on, I don't believe Calvary ought to cause us to stand with folded arms and dry eyes and unmoved hearts. I believe Calvary ought to grip us again tonight. Come on, let's clap our hands to the Lord and ask him to have his way as we worship the Lord one more time. Oh, come on, praise him. That's not near good enough. That's not near good enough. Come on, the Longhorns get better than that. Come on. Hallelujah, hallelujah. Turn to your neighbor and tell him I'm going to help the preacher preach tonight. Turn to your neighbor and tell him I'm going to help the preacher preach tonight. And if you're going to do that, you can be seated. This is the hour in which Jesus' friends disappeared. This was the hour in which his enemies emerged. In fact, we find young people in this story that we find mentioned in Matthew chapter 27. We find where he is deserted and by himself. In fact, a careful analysis of this story you will find that this is the greatest of all the sorrows that he will feel on the cross. It was the feeling of being abandoned. It was the feeling of being by himself. It was the feeling of being alone in his most crucial hour of his life. He was by himself. To this end was he born, and for this cause he came into the earth. He set his face like a flint toward Jerusalem, knowing that the only thing that awaited him there was a cruel scourging and a terrible crucifixion. Yet he went there, yet he would not be turned. And when Peter tried to turn him, Jesus said, Get behind me, Satan. Thou savorest not the things that be of God. You're talking like a man now. Jesus was determined to go through with this thing. He was born to die. And die he must. And die he will. <laughs> I don't know about the rest of you teenagers, but I'm so glad he did. I stand here tonight as a testimony that his death was worth it. Come on, anybody that's got the Holy Ghost and been baptized in Jesus' name ought to get on your feet for a moment and say, I thank God that I was worth enough to Jesus Christ for him to give his life for me. Come on, he deserves your praise. Come on, he deserves more than your yawn and the glance at your watch. He deserves your undivided attention. He deserves your praise tonight. Come on, so give it up to Jesus for a minute. In his most crucial hour, young people, he was abandoned. He was by himself. This was the greatest pain he would feel on the cross. This was the greatest agony he would experience. For the prophet said he was led as a lamb before his shearers as dumb. Yet he opened not his mouth. I don't hear him in terrible agony over the whipping that he had received. I don't hear him crying out with a loud voice when they drove the nails deep into the flesh of his hands and his feet. I don't hear him scream in agony and beg for some kind of assistance when they thrust the thorns down on his brow. But when he felt himself alone, he cried out, My God, my God, why am I forsaken? He's alone. He's by himself. He suffered a greater agony of the, than the nails and the cat of nine tails and the thorns that were plaited for his brow. He was alone. The crowd was there. 
Yes, they had come to see the spectacle of justice delivered. He's going to be nailed to a cross, yet he hangs there alone. How could it be that in this vast crowd of humanity that one man's agony could not touch somebody's heart? How is it that this writhing on this agonizing tree could not touch one person's heart? How unfeeling could they be? How hard could they be? How unemotional must they have been? How disconnected could they have been to stand and watch this man literally bleed to death and not do something about it? The sad thing about it all is it's happening in this service tonight. For he is in this room. The blood of Calvary still avails. The crucifixion still has power. Yet we are unmoved, uninterested, bored, and waiting for the next thing on the schedule. But I've come to testify tonight that there's going to be one in this crowd, at least I know. And it's going to be the guy behind this pulpit that says, God, I don't want one service going by without me getting what I need. I'm not going to go one service without saying, Lord, talk to my heart. Reach down and get a hold of me. Come on, somebody praise him for a minute. Come on, somebody praise the Lord for a minute. God wants to talk to us in this service. God wants to get a hold of us. In Jesus' name. The Bible tells us in verse 47, some of them stood there and when they heard him cry with a loud voice, they said, this man calleth for Elias. Notice they misunderstood his agony. He said nothing about Elias. In fact, he said, Eli, Eli, lama sabachthani. Nowhere in there did he call for Elias. They misunderstood what he said. And nobody has ever been more misunderstood by his friends, by his foes, by his disciples, or by his enemies. His doctrines have been corrupted. Every generation adds to the smear and the Da Vinci Code piles it on again. He came eating and drinking and they said, behold, he's a gluttonous man and a wine bibber and a drunkard. He cast out devils and they said, by Beelzebub does he cast out devils. They counted him guilty of blasphemy. Every act was twisted. Every relationship was twisted to mean something else. Now even in his most crucial hour, they don't even give him the common courtesy of listening to what he says. In his most crucial hour, he says, Eli, Eli. And they say he calls for Elias. Could it be that they heard him, but they were not listening? (laughs) Could it be that they heard him say something, but they were not really listening? (laughs) You see, a mother's child cries in the middle of the night. (laughs) The child cannot speak. The child cannot make words. But the mother knows the voice of her child. That child will grunt and make noises but that mother knows what that child desires a loved one on their deathbed gasping for the next breath everybody shuts the fans off they turn the radio down they shut everything off and say wait a minute i've got to hear what grandpa is saying it's only common courtesy the tone is inarticulate but yet our ears strain to make a connection i go to the Mexican restaurant and they can't quite pick me up and I can't quite pick them up so I speak louder and more clearly it has nothing to do with how loud I'm speaking it has to do with what I'm saying 
so Jesus is hanging on the cross calling for God and they say he's calling for Elias they chose to misunderstand him he plainly said Eli Eli and have you ever noticed how easy it was for them to be mistaken it revolves around a couple of letters the first three letters of Elias are E L I and that's exactly what he said he said Eli he did not add an A S on the end he did not say Elias so they jumped to conclusions they heard him say Eli, so they interpreted as meaning he's calling for Elias. And they totally missed what Jesus was saying and what his word was to them. Young people, we cannot come to this camp and sit here for five days and five nights and miss. We don't have the time. I don't have the energy. This youth committee doesn't have the wisdom to waste their time on you if you're not willing to say, God, speak to my heart. Come on, somebody give the Lord praise right now. I want somebody to talk to God right now. Lord, I want you to open my heart. I want you to open my ears. I want you to open my mind. I believe you're going to talk to me this week. Come on, clap your hands unto the Lord. We cannot allow ourselves to be guilty, young people, of the same sin of assumption. Jesus was screaming. He was not to be mistaken. It, was, it would be one thing, Brother Enzi, if he's whispering. It would be one thing if he's kind of groveling around in a comatose state and he's mumbling and slobbering, but that's not the condition he's in. He is belting it out. This is his last bit of strength, and he g gathers up every bit of strength he's got. And Matthew said with a loud voice, Eli! Eli! Lama Sabathani! And everybody that was there, everybody that was participating, said he's calling for Elias. He was not calling for Elias at all. He was calling for Eli. God, he was calling for help. And we can't sit through service after service and hear his voice. Thank you, musicians, praise singers. Thank you to all the men that sang the specials tonight. You know what? If you have any ounce of spirituality in your heart, you have to say that I heard his voice from the first note of the worship service until the preaching of the word. I've heard his voice in this service. But you know what? I cannot afford to go through this service and misunderstand what he's saying. Could it be that I'm just missing everything he is saying? Could it be I think he's asking for someone else? And while I sit on the pew indifferent and cold and maybe not where I should be, I think, well, tonight's not my night. It's the night for somebody else. Or maybe this is for so-and-so. Or I wish somebody else would respond. You need to understand that he's calling for you tonight. First Corinthians 14 says there are, it may be, so many kinds of voices in the world and none of them without signification. The Bible tells us there's not a voice in the world that's insignificant. They all buy for your attention. You see it in the media. You hear it on the radio. You see it in the newspaper. Hollywood produces it for you, and they're vying for your attention. We live in a world that's looking for your attention. The media blitz takes, takes an incredible amount of money to get your attention, and it is unbelievable. 
unbelievable what they spend for 30 seconds of your attention. Elijah was looking for God in the media blitz, and the wind blew, and the fire fell, and the earth shook, and God wasn't in it. You better be careful what you say God's in and what he's not in, for there may come a moment when the wind has passed, and the fire has gone out, and the earth quit shaking, that you listen and you hear a still, small voice. No, we may not run the aisles and run our way out of a commitment. No, we may not beat the band tonight and jump and shout, but I'm praying our ears could tune in to heaven and say, God, this week, I want to hear what you have to say to me. Could it be that he is speaking in this service and you have yet to pick it up? Could it be that while everybody else was feeling something, you were feeling nothing? While everybody else was standing here, down here and jumping and raising their hands and clapping, and then when we started singing those worship courses, the tears began to flow, and you stood there and looked at them thinking, what are they feeling? What's going on? What are they so emotional about? Well, friend, you better check your spirit. It just so happens you might be eight feet from Calvary and be unmoved. What a challenge you must receive tonight. To be this close to an entertain, to be this close to entertaining God, to be this close to His presence, to be right here in the presence of Almighty God and miss it. What a tragedy! I'm convinced what's happening in this service happened way back there on Calvary's Hill. They were eight feet from the precious blood of Jesus hitting the ground. They were ten feet, what, one yard, or maybe ten yards from the Lamb of God giving his life. And they were too busy to even listen to what he was saying. I don't know how many of them brought a picnic but they were spreading it out for the holiday festivities. Passover was a big deal. It was a big family occasion. And while they're passing the hors d'oeuvres and drinking their lemonade, he's hanging on a cross screaming, Will anybody listen to what he's saying? I've got a commission for you tonight, Texas young people. Will anybody hear what he says this week? Are we going to go through the motions and play ball and have great games and have great fellowship and trade email addresses and cell phone numbers and really not get what God is saying to us? I feel the Holy Ghost in this room right now. God is not going to let us go any further without having a visitation, without answering to his presence in this room tonight. I'm not going to waste another moment. I'm going to give him my attention. I'm going to give him my heart. I'm going to give him my adoration. Come on, get the hand of the person beside you. I don't care if they're black, white, male, or female. Get the hand of the one beside you right now, and I want you to pray. God, get a hold of us in the next few moments. Do not let us leave the same way we came in. I want to hear your voice. I want to hear what you're saying, God. I refuse to go through the motions. I refuse to sit 10 yards from an altar and not feel anything. I refuse to sit in the same building with a preacher and the Word and your spirit and leave unchanged. Jesus. Scream at me tonight, God. Get a hold of me. Let your voice scream out in my spirit tonight. Young people, let me tell you something. 
and I'm hurrying to a close. Let me tell you something very important. You see, the problem is Young, young People's Committee, Youth Committee of the Texas District has worked very hard to put this camp together. But let me tell you what the problem is. The problem is tonight, I'm just one voice among many. There's all kind of voices going through your head right now. While this preacher is preaching, you're hearing the voice of your boyfriend or your girlfriend saying, don't make that commitment. Let's don't do that. Let's don't go down to that altar. You're hearing the voice of an alcoholic father saying, I don't, you're trying to be holier than thou. You're trying to be perfect. I hate you. You're hearing teachers saying, you're stupid. You'll never amount to anything. You're hearing grandparents saying, I don't know what's the matter with your parents. You're hearing all kind of voices in your your head. You're hearing the devil tell you you shouldn't try again. You're hearing condemnation say you're not worth it. You're hearing depression say you might as well give up now. And I want to tell you emphatically, I believe you're in this room. The voices of addiction are telling you that you're a prisoner and that you will never be loosed. But I've come to tell you there's a voice that trumps all other voices. Oh, yes. John chapter 8, and you shall know the truth, and the truth shall make you free. Oh, I wish somebody would hear him tonight. He's screaming. It. Where's the sound man? Give me some juice. Give me some juice. Come on, I wish somebody would hear what he's saying in this room up here out there. I wish you would hear what he's saying. He's saying he can make you free. He can make you a new creature. He can make you changed. Come on, somebody shout unto the Lord. Oh, that's right. That's right. The devil's screaming at you tonight telling you you're not worth it you're not good enough you messed up for the last time that God's grace is, cannot reach you but let me remind you Romans 8 there is therefore now no condemnation to them which are in Christ Woo! come on you need to tune your ears God is saying something to you tonight Come on, clap your hands unto the Lord. We're hurrying to a close. Come on. You can be seated. He's screaming. Some of them said, he calls for Elias. They made no effort to understand him. No effort to figure out what he was saying. He was interrupting their picnic. Their lamb leg and their crackers and cheese. Oh, what's, what's that he said? Oh, he's calling for Elias. Just another prisoner dying on the cross. He's yelling for Elias. Don't pay him no attention. How can they be that casual? But the Bible tells us in Matthew 27, we read it, you read it with me. It says one of them's in that crowd. One. One's in that crowd, Brother Darren. One fella. I don't know where it came from. Don't know what his name was. Don't know how many times he'd been to Jerusalem on a Passover feast. But he's standing in that crowd watching this man die. And he says, wait a minute. Forget the picnic. Forget the leg of lamb and the cheese and crackers. Somebody's got to do something. This man's hurting. This man's dying. I can't sit here unmoved. I cannot stay here and eat my little lunch. So he looks around. I don't know if he brought vinegar with him. I don't know if he ran to the Huck store or to the gas station and bought some. I have no idea if he carried vinegar around with him. But one thing is for sure. This one man was diligent enough to search until he found some vinegar and he put it in a sponge. 
And while everybody else is sitting there eating their leg of lamb, he runs up to the cross and he sticks that sponge. I don't hear a cheer from the crowd. I don't hear him say, yeah, that's it. No. You see, he had vinegar mixed with gall. And when you understand what that was, that was a sedative. It was like morphine. You know what morphine is? People go through surgery. They put a morphine pump on them. And every time they hurt, they can push the button. It takes away the pain. That's what vinegar and gall was. This man said, I can't stop him from dying, but I can ease the pain. Wait now, wait now, wait now, wait now. So he runs up to Jesus with an intoxicant, with a drug. And he says, here, this will help. I, I cannot fault him for his effort. I cannot cross my arms and say, what an idiot, doesn't he know that Jesus is not going to take that? No, he wants to feel sin for every man and every woman. But you know what? I cannot sit there and fault his effort. Everybody else is eating their picnic. At least he's doing something. Wait, wait. And they're in this room tonight while your soul is searching for God you're offering it vinegar and gall you're offering it intoxicants that's why Miller High Life can never satisfy what you find in this altar that's why cocaine and meth will never ever equal what you feel in the presence Oh, I wish somebody heard what I was saying now. I don't care how much crack you do. You can never match the high that you get when you kneel at the feet of the cross. No, 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 no. <laughs> at least one of them was trying it reminds me of the words of David Brainerd. Say what you want to about his message and how much truth he had. But at least he had enough to motivate him to die in the winter wilderness with the people that he felt himself called to preach to. And this is what he wrote in his own journal about the Indian drums in the distance that caused fear to rise in his heart. He said, God, forgive them. Their drums are just the sounds of their seeking. Say what you will about the guy this Friday night that finds himself in a bar. He slips up under the on top of the stool under the bar and all night long he wastes his paycheck he gets slapped, drop dead drunk. They have to drag him out, call a taxi for him, and take him home. Say what you will about him, but at least he's searching. <laughs> he's, he's looking. He's trying to find something. Now you can sit there and not move, but at least he's moving. I gotta find something to satisfy me. Come on now. And if you're not careful, you're going to be there. If Calvary can't touch you, you're going to try to find something that will. Oh. You go on the internet, got to find something to satisfy. You go to the club, got to find something to satisfy. You'll try to find it in drugs, immorality, alcohol, sports. But honey, in the final analysis, it's just vinegar. It'll never take away the anguish of your soul. And that's why Jesus turned away from it. He said, oh no, I appreciate your effort, but 
I don't need that kind of help. I'm looking for God. <laughs> I'm trying to, my God! My God! Where are you? I don't need your vinegar. I don't need your heroin. I don't need your morality. I'm looking for God. Get out of my way. I'm trying to find him. Oh, but that's not the that's not the startling reality of the conclusion of this message. <laughs> Some of them listened well enough to say, oh, I, I think he's calling for Elias. I, I think that's what he said. And one guy says, oh, somebody's got to do something. He ran forward. But it's the rest of them that shocked me to no end. The rest of them said, let be. In other words, leave him alone. Don't anybody do anything. Don't move. Don't go to the altar. Don't try to help him. Don't cry. Don't feel sorry for him. Let's just stop and watch and see if Elias will come. They're here tonight. They stand sporadically around this building and dare you to look at them and say, excuse me, I'm going to the altar. And dare you to make a move to the front of this church. Yeah. They're wanting you to stand there till Thursday night or Friday night and waste four nights of camp. Intimidators around the cross. Cool people. Oh yeah, you're here. And they were there at Calvary. And they stood around the cross and said, Don't anybody move. Everybody stay in your chair. Let's just watch this. I want to tell you what, friend, they do better for their crippled horse. Come on, I, I can't remember its name. Barbasol or Barbarol or I, that, that lame horse. The, the, the winner, the one that was picked to win the race. And he comes out of the chute. And just a little ways out of the chute, he comes up lame. And you saw pictures of it all over the place. And people saying, oh, what about it? Hey, they do more for a horse. They do more for an animal. And yet Jesus is calling you. And you have the audacity to stand there and watch. Well, this sermon's over. God's calling. His voice is reaching. His hand is outstretched. Are you going to wait? Come on. Let's in mass right now. Let's in mass as one, one body of believers, get out of those pews, rush to this altar, and say, Lord, I want to hear your voice. I want to hear what you have to say to me this week, God. Never let me go. Never let me go. Are you going to stand 30 feet from the cross and be unmoved? Be untouched? How hard are you, friend? How stony is your heart? Surely he's reaching for you tonight. Surely he's calling your name. Find the way. Bring me back. Bring me back to you. Let's sing it now. You're all I want. You're all I want. You're all I want. You're all I ever need. Come on, he's screaming.
on, don't be afraid to pray for your friend. Don't be afraid to move through this altar and find a friend you know struggling. And pray and intercede. Reach God for them. Come on. Don't be afraid to move through this crowd and find a friend that you know needs the Holy Ghost. That you know come from a broken home or a family that doesn't serve God. Come on. They're in this altar. They need you. Come on right now. Let's let the Lord use us. If you've got the Holy Ghost, let the Lord use you right now. Find my way. 